Hi, this is Ian Wright here, and um, I'm just going to talk about today, I'm going to talk about DCD, which is Developmental Coordination Disorder. This is part two in a series on specific learning and behavioral difficulties. I'm going to talk about this in a little degree of depth, because this is this podcast is for parents. Why am I doing this podcast? It's for parents, but it's also for students because I teach pediatrics um, in a, quite a lot of different places. And so I'm kind of crossing two boundaries here. So sometimes if things are a little too complex, just let it go and pick it up afterwards because I'm going to try and keep it as, as simple as I can in, in the main. And what we're trying to do is understand this particularly common difficulty in children, how it affects children, and what's the best way of tackling it, which is what we're really all about here. Um, I've been treating um, DCD for many years. Other, in other terms, it's called dyspraxia. Um, I remember 20 years ago, my practice in Ireland, I used to get every three or four weeks, we'd get, I'd get literally a bus load, a mini bus load of of children with dyspraxia who'd come down uh, from Galway, which is about three hours away from us. And um, and I'd spend a lot of my day actually treating these children. Um, but I've been teaching this for possibly 20 years now and, and uh, I'm treating a lot of children with these. So I'm quite familiar with them and some of the, some of the more subtle effects and some of the more subtle causes in DCD and that's what I suppose we really want to talk about here. So DCD, Developmental Coordination Disorder or Dyspraxia, um, it affects about I think five to six percent of school children worldwide um, and its primary effects are coordination planning and coordinating movements. Now, a child will get a diagnosis of this if there is nothing else neurological that's causing this, for example, cerebral palsy or other neurological, primary neurological conditions. This is a, this is a caused by itself. It's a separate issue to any kind of, anything that's caused by damage. Um, it's much more subtle than that and much more common. But it doesn't just affect coordination, it can affect other things which I'm going to come to, like uh, working memory, short-term memory. Um, and you can have other sensory issues and other associated issues, which I'll talk about in a bit. But primarily, the child who has DCD has a tendency to have difficulty coordinating, coordinating hand movements writing once they start going to school they have difficulty with writing they have difficulty with holding things they have difficulty with fine coordination and gross coordination so balance can be difficult they fall over a lot they tend to be bruised um, quite often they tend to knock into things um, they have poor slightly they can have hypotonia some poor muscle tone um, poor timing coordinated movements sequential movements are difficult. Um, their spatial awareness, the awareness of themselves and their surrounds is, is difficult. And their coordination, their proprioception, their understanding of their joint spaces, functions in space are difficult. They have clumsiness. They have difficulties actually with um, their left and right balance. They're, they're not quite sure of their left and right. They can be kind of neurologically confused in terms of their left or right. Um, Pencil grip is one of the key areas. Now, I mean, when does this start? This this is from birth, and actually you can physiologically sometimes pick these up from very, very young. But it's manifest, actually, as a child goes through their developmental milestones. For, for example, crawling. Often they don't crawl. They go straight to a walking. Walking can be delayed. Their normal sitting up, um, standing, walking can be slow. Um, it starts to really manifest in terms of the development of their gait and their posture. They can have a wide gait for a long... I mean, all babies, toddlers have a wide gait, but it continue, can continue. Um, 
then it manifests more as a child tries to sit down, concentrate at school, write, um, and use their, their working memory. Um, and this can, and this is when we, we start to see children sort of, when they really start coming to us is but sort of between, I mean, it's much better to see them young, much younger than this, which I'll talk about, but actually when they're much younger. So, um, but it, it manifests often when they go to school. So they can have low self-esteem because of this, because they can slightly feel somewhat different, but they can also be aggressive, hyperactive, and there can be social issues, including um, bullying or feeling separate or feeling lonely, a slight disconnection. Also, there can be associated issues which can be a different diagnosis but can be connected to it, the most common being dyslexia in terms of difficulty reading. But there can be ADHD, attention deficit, hyperactivity disorder, um, dyscalculia, difficulty with figures, um, autistic spectrum disorder, um, sensory uh, processing disorder, so where there's difficulties, they can be um, overwhelmed with their sensory. Each of these associated subjects I'm going to spend a time and I'm going to talk about because they're, they're different in terms of their, their cause and function and how we look at them. Um, and I will come back to those in different times. But the interesting thing here is when I was first working, a child would have one diagnosis. Now they can have four or five. It's normal. And it actually makes more sense because there's a lot of things that cross over um, dysgraphia as well. Um, so we've got a lot of dif differing things that can interrelate, but we're talking here about the coordination aspect. Now there is another element to this, which is um, DVD, which is developmental, not a DVD player, <laughs> it's uh, developmental verbal dys uh, dyspraxia, which is a difficulty in speech and language coordination because actually the part of the brain that's involved with DCD um, coordination disorders can be involved with, with coordinating speech and language and it can manifest in difficulty in speech and the development of speech, especially in, in relationship to um, sequencing, forming sentences, and also the difficult, actually, <laughs> physiologically difficult thing of coordinating breathing, salivation with tongue function in terms of speech. So actually there's a lot involved in speech in terms of coordinating different parts of mouth function. And that can be difficult um, when they have DVD and speech and language can be affected. They don't have to connect, but they can. You can have um, a coordinational disorder which can affect speech and language and coordination, or speech and language isn't necessarily affected in any way at all. So what we really want to look at is actually how we can look at this and manifest this. So what it tends to happen, it tends to be diagnosed often early on in school where there's difficulty hold, writing, holding the pencil, um, often a difficulty in concentration, um, and some uh, speech and language can often be involved, or um, difficulty in, in working memory, so functioning memory, remembering to do things, remembering to bring your pencils, etc., etc. So the teachers will often be the first to to diagnose it, but you can see some of these developmental symptoms early on. And what it, what causes this? It's a it's an interesting subject, and really, you know, um, if you look up the medical text, they say, well, it's unknown. There's, there's no particular reason for this. What, what is known, though, is that it affects, actually, boys much more than girls. In, in actually, four times as many boys, actually, uh, are affected to girls. And for me, I mean, my own personal view, having treated many, many hundreds of these cases and looked a lot at the uh, embryology and uh, the functional embryology um, of how the brain develops... I think that it possibly is a, a combination of factors. There are some particular cases where there's, there's a very clear trigger that can have set it off. The part of the brain that's involved with um, DCD, DVD, is the cerebellum, which is at the back of the head. It's the base and the back of the head, the kind of, it's the occiput, it's underneath the occiput, which is the top of the head and the neck where they meet. and 
that part of the brain is one of the last and slowest to develop uh, the, 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 the cerebellum. It typically, lots of its development ha- actually happens the, the, in the last sort of five weeks before a baby's born, between say week 34 and say 39, 40. Um, and it's a very interesting in how the cerebellum develops. It, it develops like a flowering, a branching. It's like one shoot comes off and opens up and repeats itself. And there's this repeated flowering. And it opens up literally like a flower that opens up. And if anything affects that, you know, like for example, I mean, I, I, I remember cases where there was, say, something like very high temperature um, chicken pox at week 35 in pregnancy where these things can, it can just have these subtle effects on this lack of full expression and opening. Or, so viruses can be involved. There's definitely a genetic component. Um, Prematurity, because actually a lot of this development happens, you know, around the birth and after birth. If there's any difficulties with prematurity or they're in a compromised position in terms of pre-birth or there's a there's birth trauma that can have an effect it's unknown really but there's often a combination of these factors and actually us as osteopaths are trying to look at some of these threads that make up the problem so what we're interested in as osteopaths is how it's not fully expressing itself and allowing it to fully express its function now some of the things from a from our point of view an osteopathic point of view um that are part of a, a DCD pattern and a story are the development of midline. There's a lack of strength in this child's midline. They don't hold their posture correctly. They tend to have a kypholordosis, meaning the head and neck are forwards. They stick their tummy out. Their legs are uh, internally rotated and they're, they're actually, their, their arches are on their medial arches of their feet, longitudinal arches tend to be flat. So everything's kind of dropped down and their for, heads are forwards. Their, their occiput, which is the bone at the back of the head, can be flat. So you've got this whole anterior posture where they stick their tummy out, throw their shoulders forwards, their head is forwards. That's very much part of it. They can also have a, a class 2 malocclusion where the maxilla is, is, is posterior and the jaw is behind. It's, the jaw is backwards. And so everything, the, the, the lower face hasn't fully opened up. That's part of it as well. So you have this this midline difficulty and this difficulty in posture and full expression. And our jobs in those cases to strengthen those areas up, strengthen up the posture, strengthen up the midline expression, open up this area between the back and the head, get full and free expression of it. So the question is, I mean, we just talk about this very briefly, is how, you know, when to treat, when do we treat these children? Well, actually, we treat them as early as we can. The younger it's spotted, the quicker we can change it. You know, a, a, a child's brain has a huge amount of what's known as plasticity, which is a remodeling of itself, especially under four or five years old. It's, it's phenomenal, the amount of expression. So actually, under four is absolutely the best time. But actually, you can still work with these patterns up into their teens. You can still get fairly nice changes in them. Um, so what, we, what our, our job is to really free up this area that, that tends to be blocked and allow it to, to express and, and form and grow as much as it can. So we're interested in freeing up the blocks, um, especially in that part around the, the occiput and the cerebellum, which can be very much compromised. But also when, when we're managing these cases, you know, self-esteem is important. They have stress. They, have, they can have a tendency anxiety. So the nervous systems are kind of locked down. And us osteopaths are very good at unwinding tension in the body because children hold hold tension on a very visceral bodily level and we're very good at freeing up tension in children which actually is I think a huge part when you're working with these children but one thing I would say is if you're if you have a child with DCD it needs to be a team that manages the child so physiotherapy is absolutely excellent and occupational therapy um, you need specific exercises um, there are certain exercises that are very important for in, in, in dyspraxias, like um, trampolining, which is excellent for, for coordination and strength of midline development. Some spinning techniques where you develop the, the function of the inner ear um, is very important in terms of coordination and, and strengthening the midline. So there's a lot of stuff like neurodevelopmental therapy is, is very, very good as well. So actually, the idea is to have a team working. The osteopath is very much part of that because we're looking at some of the under, underlying structural things. 
but actually working with with the occupational therapy as to how the child functions in their environment is very very important and physiotherapy especially with regards to specific focused exercises is very very important and you need a team actually when um i was just having um looking at the idea of when we're in in, in italy and florence setting up um this paediatrics clinic where which we're thinking of doing which actually has the full team involved so you can treat these conditions as one so the whole team can look at them and i think that is really is the way forward so everyone can have their input and you can have maximum changes in the child anyway that's a that's an idea so um so there's a lot involved in this and it's one of many threads of these specific learning um and specific behavioral difficulties and they all cross over and interchange um but for me the personally early management is so important in terms of later outcomes the more you can input them in terms of all these these therapeutic and actually you need all of these therapeutic inputs very young because the the brain has a great ability to remodel itself and change and strengthen up and the better the more you can get the younger you can still affect them as they get older but you know you intervene early and you can really minimize the effects of these of these you know conditions that can be quite stressful and and can have quite an effect on development and um and there is things you can do i suppose that's the important thing you know that can actually at least help this situation to some degree um we'll pick this up in the next one thank you